Greetings and welcome to an LGR thing. It's just going to be kind of a, a laid back, hopefully relaxed <laughs> kind of build video today because that's what I'm in the mood for. And in particular, I've just been really wanting to mess with this lovely board here. This is a 486 SBC or single board computer. It was recently donated to the channel. Uh, thank you very much once again for this. I've had a number of SBCs sent in recently, but this is the one that intrigues me the most at this moment in particular right now. Because it's a 486 and it is very densely packed with things. I don't know precisely when this was manufactured, but typically these were made after a lot of the components were already kind of uh, past their shelf life and often used in business and industrial situations where they needed legacy support for whatever kind of hardware or software they were using, but you can get it in a much more compact package. It is newly manufactured and what well, it was at the time. So a lot of these uh, seem to be from like the late 90s, early 2000s. And uh, here's the model number for this one. If anybody's curious, wants to look that up. I haven't done a ton of research on this particular board, but uh, I have tested it just real quick to see if it powers on and works and it does. And that's really kind of the cool part about this is it's effectively a 486 computer all on one board, but you do need uh, an ISA backplane, which is something like this right here. And the board just plugs into this and it gives you things like power, uh, keyboard port if it didn't already have one, and a bunch of expansion slots. So in this case, we've got four 16-bit ISA slots and four PCI, and then another couple PCI over here. Kind of looks like VLB, but it's not. I'm not sure if this is the exact backplane I'm going to go with, but uh, I did run across this in a listing of other things I was getting. I'm like, okay, cool, I'll grab this one too, see what it's like. Like I said, I do have a number of backplanes to choose from, but we're gonna try this one first. And really the whole idea is that you just take the SBC, plug it in right there, and then you got your single board computer solution with a bunch of expansion slots. And you can stick this into the case of your choosing. But yeah, I just love the whole idea behind these. It's just, it's so much 90s computing power packed into such a small little area. And this one in particular has a lot of great options already installed. So we got VGA uh, output right there, nine pin serial keyboard and mouse PS2 ports. Uh, RAM, of course, this one has 16 megs installed already. Uh, of course, the CPU is under there. Uh, and then and there's chipsets for all kinds of things just integrated onto the board. So the Sears Logic Graphics, a CLGD 54M30. I'm not super familiar with its capabilities, but there it is. We'll see. And it's got a bunch of controllers built in as well. So we don't need to install expansion cards like you do on a lot of other 486 boards, like my wood grain PC, for instance. And so you have IDE, floppy, and you've got a little parallel thingy right there. So if you want to plug in a breakout deal and put that in the back of your case to get parallel, they can do that. It's even got a little PC speaker right there. It does have a Dallas clock chip, but it's socketed. So that's easily replaceable. If it's bad, I don't know. I don't think it is. It didn't seem to be when I tested this earlier. Um, but yeah, I mean, all kinds of other little headers and a ton of jumpers for a lot of different options. I mean, even a little place for a key lock right there if you've got a key lock in your case. And this right here as well. This is pretty fun, I think. See, it says disc on chip. So that is for one of these little things right here, a disc on chip module. This is a 64 meg one. They do come much larger, smaller too, but it's just a little chip here and it gives you a hard disc that you can boot from. And so if you wanted to install the operating system just directly on here, you just insert that and you don't need to mess with a hard drive. On the other hand, another thing that was really kind of made for these setups is this right here. This is a, a disc on module or industrial flash disc module. It's got four pin Molex for power and that just plugs directly into the IDE on there. And that's another version of storage for really any kind of computer of a compatible type, but especially made for these SBCs. This one's a 512 meg module. So yeah, uh, we're gonna go ahead and assemble this in a, a case that I've had lying around for a very long time and decided to finally clean it up. And this is the case, which like I said, I've had it for a very long time. So long, in fact, that I don't even remember how or where I got it, but it's just something I've kept on hand, 
you know, it's a little bit dirty and aged like a fine yellow wine, but uh, I, I like the simplicity of it. It's just a basic mid-90s beige box clone PC case with a pair of five and a quarter inch and three and a half inch drive bays, three LEDs, a reset button, and a turbo and power switch. There are these big plastic rectangular buttons here that sort of push inward. Eh, it's a little different than any other case I have. And it is indeed a Baby AT style case, which means that it takes a smaller Baby AT motherboard, which should be pretty much perfect for the ISA backplane we have. It's about the same size anyway, and has a spot for eight expansion cards around back, a couple metal breakout areas for things like parallel and serial port, and of course an AT style keyboard connector. So yeah, pretty much just a blank slate style case, which is exactly what I'm going for here because I don't know exactly what I'm building yet. Another thing that I find kind of endearing about this case is uh, the system builder, whoever had this back in the day, which is ECM Systems. A nice blue and white kind of clear plastic crystal looking badge. I like it. I might even keep it on there. In fact, there's a sticker around back as well, ECM Inc. in Marlboro, Connecticut. So shout out to them. Don't know how it ended up down here in North Carolina, but here it is. Another slight mystery is that around front you have, <laughs> it just has food written on the front drive bay cover. I don't know why, but it's been there ever since I got it, along with some, it looks like masking tape residue. And also like this, it's just something else I don't have in any other case. It's this teeny little Energy Star badge. And it looks like it was made for this case, or the case was designed with it in mind because it's kind of a peculiar size in terms of being long and rectangular. Just a couple of M3 screws around back holding the case lid on. It's one of those where it's sort of an enclosure going all the way around the case. Not my favorite, but hey, inside it's pretty clean. There is a power supply in here, a bunch of cables for the front stuff on the case, as well as an instruction manual for what I assume was the motherboard that used to be in here, a Pine PT430 486 VLB board, which Looks like it would have been a pretty nice little thing to have in there, but yeah, it's long gone by the time I got it. Mmm, check out that centerfold. I uh, love a good line art diagram layout. And lastly, inside this case, there is the power supply that was just hanging around from whenever I got it. It's a 230 watt power supply, and it does work. I haven't actually tested any of the rails to see if it's putting out proper voltage or anything. I don't know if I'll use it. I have another new old stock AT power supply. I'd probably use that instead, but eh. Since I had it all taken apart recording this footage, I just went ahead and started scrubbing it down. Although there's not a whole lot to really scrub away on here. It wasn't particularly dirty. The enclosure is all painted metal. So there were some gouges and bits there that I can't really get rid of by scrubbing away. It's just metal and paint that's worn away. So I don't know, maybe I'll cover this in some kind of a vinyl wrap. I haven't decided yet at this point. In the end, it cleaned up nicely and so did the front of the case, although it is rather yellowed, and I don't currently have any solution left for retro brighting purposes. So I'm just cleaning this up as best as I can for now, and leaving it as is. Simply giving it a well-earned scrubbing and wipe down that I don't think it's ever had, at least not since I've owned it. Really, the components that needed the most cleaning were the drive bay covers <laughs> with that food emblazoned on the plastic and on top of the tape residue. All of that scrubbed off very easily, although not entirely evenly. Eh, it looks all right, actually. And then around back, there was some more tape and papery residue, presumably some kind of labels that were there, as well as some handwritten labeling of some Sharpie text just saying where all the different ports were whenever things were installed here in the past. And yeah, just a little bit of scrubbing and then a little bit of alcohol and that all came off pretty well. There's still a little bit left, but yeah, it's fine. Not going for pristine showroom material here or anything. Although I did want to replace all of the expansion slot covers because it was missing most of them for one thing and the ones that were in there were kind of yeah, ratty looking. So I replaced them with all brand new super shiny plates. Another thing I was noticing as I was cleaning is it just has a little bit of a wobble to it. It's got these rubber feet on the bottom that I don't know if they've worn unevenly or they just weren't ever on there completely properly to begin with. But I just used some furniture casters, foam and cloth feet and stuck those on the bottom there to kind of even things out and make sure that it slides around a little easier on the tabletop. I always like doing this anyway. And at this point, I just wanted to prep the motherboard area because 
This actually doesn't have a whole lot of standoffs built in already, which is not uncommon for cases of this type. There's only three metal standoffs. The rest are all these plastic ones. And they sort of slide in there and then clip into place where there's some holes on the motherboard or the back plane in this case. <laughs> In, in this case. It will be in this case soon once we get it installed. Which to do that just get the three and a half inch drive bay cage out of the way and then we're gonna drop the motherboard in place and yeah it's ready to start screwing things in and getting stuff installed so let's do that. Alrighty so getting the back plane in here is pretty straightforward with that drive cage out of the way. Just gonna drop it onto the plastic standoffs and then screw it into the metal ones in the middle there. And that's that. It's secured in place. We're ready to plug in some things. Like the power supply. And yeah I'd mentioned that I was thinking about swapping out the power supply to a new old stock one and well that was the plan until I noticed that the way that this case is set up it's integrated with the existing power supply. This whole front panel is all connected and kind of weird and I don't feel like rewiring it for this little project. It's tested, it does work, it's just uh, not quite what I had planned on. And for that matter, I didn't actually check beforehand to see whether or not there would be any headers for all the buttons and LEDs on the front of the case. With the back plane itself only having headers for the AT and ATX power supplies as well as some fans, and some keyboard connectors, and some other things like that. Probably none of which we're going to use. And on the SBC card itself there are a ton of jumpers and headers, but of course it's all crammed in here and is not labeled. So I had to go and seek out some documentation. And while I wasn't able to find the exact manual for this particular board, I did find another one in the range that seems to be pretty close. And that one mentions that there are headers for the reset button, the hard disk LED, and an external PC speaker. But not any headers for the power LED or for the turbo button. So I can get the other things plugged into here at least, including the external speaker because I like the way that those cones sound better than the little piezo beeper on here. And we'll just get that plugged into the ISA slot at the bottom. It'll live here, I suppose. And then we'll get the AT power connectors plugged in. Black wire up against black, of course. And I'm going to go ahead and power it on here really quick to make sure we got a connection. And check this out. Neat. Yeah, we've got power, but we've also got five LEDs. Or really four LEDs out of the possible five. And these indicate power going to the individual rails. And you can see here it's got everything powered except for the plus 3.3 volt rail. And well, this is an AT power supply. The 3.3 volt thing came along with ATX as far as I know. And in case you're wondering what it looks like with an ATX power supply plugged in, uh, here you go. We have 3.3 volts, but now the minus 5 volt rail is not lit up. And yeah, that's because ATX typically doesn't have that. As mentioned though, I'm going to stick with the AT power supply that goes in this baby AT case. And you know how I mentioned that there was no header for the power LED on here, and that's true, but I was able to get around that pretty easily. I just took some wires and put them between the power connector on the front of the case and stuck them into this unused header in the back plane, which provides ground and some voltage. Yeah, it works and gets me a power LED. Now that we've got power going to the board, let's go ahead and get some hard disks installed, or really flash memory. Which the first thing I was considering was this disk on chip. It's 64 megs, so it's not huge, but I was going to try it anyway, just have the operating system and some basic programs on there, but unfortunately I couldn't get it to work. And I don't know why exactly, it just wasn't detecting it. I've never tested this in another system. I don't have any other system to test this on, so... I had to skip it for now, and I'm going to use that disk on module over IDE. And since I wanted to install a CD-ROM alongside it, it just plugged in an IDE cable so we can get a couple devices on the one bus. And then plug in the disk on module as kind of a secondary device here, but unfortunately the connection is not quite what I need. And the only IDE cable adapter thing I have is really just an extension. What I need is a gender changing cable and I don't have one of those on hand. So I ordered one. I'm going to do that later when it shows up. And in the meantime, I'm just going to plug in the disk on module directly into the IDE interface, which is really what it's supposed to be anyway. And also going to get the floppy disk cable connected in here to the controller interface on board. And there we go. 
system starting up, performing its RAM check, and everything is perfectly fine. Hopping into the BIOS here, and yeah, it's one of these <laughs> pretty basic ones from Award Software. Not my favorite BIOS, but whatever, it works. And it detects the disk on module just fine, 500-ish megs. And now for the floppy drives. Uh, the first one I'm gonna install in here is of course a 1.44 meg high density three and a half inch floppy disk drive. And yep, floppy drive working perfectly detected straight away and can boot from an MS-DOS boot disk here and get that disk on module formatted in all 500 whatever megs of glory. Pretty much exactly 500 megs. <laughs> 499.53 usable is what it's finding, so that's cool. And with that installed on there, we got a extremely basic DOS 6.22 setup going. So uh, yeah, let's go ahead and continue installing some things. Like the five and a quarter inch floppy disk drive. I'm gonna go with this one from Toshiba, a 360K double-sided disk drive. None of that 1.2 meg nonsense here. And for the CD-ROM, I got another black facing unit, of course, but it's also a little bit newer. This is a compact OEM thing manufactured by Light On in 2003. So I think it's a 48 speed. We'll get to the CD-ROM here in a moment because that turned out to be a whole thing. But MS-DOS 6.22, yeah, just gonna go ahead and get that properly installed on there. Nice full configuration of DOS. And look at that, mm, how exciting, clean DOS. This feels like a good time to go ahead and install a sound card in here. And for that, it's gotta be a Sound Blaster 16, in particular the CT1750 model known as the MCD. And yeah, this is one of those with multiple CD-ROM interfaces on there. All those proprietary ones on the left-hand side, I'm not gonna be using those because I don't have one of those drives. But another reason I picked this one in particular is because the DSP is version 4.05, which means it won't have the hanging note bug that plagues certain Sound Blaster 16 models. So I'm gonna go ahead and get that plugged in. And since we're in here dropping stuff in, I figured why not get the parallel and serial situation sorted, or really the second serial, because there's one already on the SBC. Got these little breakout cables here, and they're gonna go into these slots up above the normal IO, and they screw into place right there with the little cables hanging out and dangling around, which I'll just string down into the bottom of the case where the SBC is, and those are gonna plug into the headers down there. So it gives us two nice ports around back, looking awesome. Now to slide in the drives, got the five and a quarter inch floppy disk. That's gonna go in here first, kind of in the middle. And then the three and a half inch goes below that, but it's gotta go in that annoying little cage. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of convenient, but kind of not. Convenient because you can just install the screws and everything in the drive externally. You don't have to do it inside the case, but inconvenient because it's got these weird little sliding mechanisms that don't line up exactly quite right. It bends a little bit. So I had to actually unscrew it and then screw it back in once it was in there, but whatever, it doesn't matter. I cut all that out. So that's in here now. Yeah, it's starting to look more like a computer, looking pretty good and get the little beige three and a half inch faceplate over here. I guess I won't be using the other ones since I'm gonna be populating both of the five and a quarter inch drive bays, meaning that I kind of cleaned them for nothing. Oh man, I wiped away food for no good reason, but it's okay, it makes me feel better. And got the CD-ROM drive, just ready to go, plopping in place right here. Yeah, it's time to start getting some things plugged in down here. We're gonna start with the serial and parallel cables, which go into these headers on the SBC itself, which are fully populated with all the pins on each of them. And unfortunately, the cables have a pin plugged <laughs> on each of the cable. I guess because this is a little bit newer of a set of ports that I'm using for the headers anyway. So yeah, you just drill those out. It doesn't matter. It's not using those pins anyway. So yeah, just drill those out, plug them in, everything's fine. And we'll go ahead and get the DOM unplugged here and the IDE cable plugged in its place, which is connected to the CD-ROM up at the top. And we'll use the little mail-to-mail -mail adapter that showed up finally. And we can plug in the disk on module to the secondary connection on the IDE cable. And well, <laughs> unfortunately, this is where things got really annoying for a couple of hours. The CD-ROM drive will not detect with the disk on module plugged into the same IDE connection. They'll work individually, but never both at once on the same channel. 
And in order to try and narrow down which device was causing the conflict, like I said, I spent a couple hours switching things around. I changed between the primary and secondary connections on the cable, you know, which devices plugged in where, switched the cable select master and slave pins on the CD-ROM anyway, the disk on module doesn't have any of those. I adjusted the IDE settings in the BIOS, I swapped the IDE cables themselves, and then I swapped out the CD-ROM for another one, that didn't work. And I swapped out the flash disk on module for a CF card adapter, and that worked. Then I went back to the other CD-ROM and it was working with the CF card adapter, but not with the disk on module, no matter what configuration I was using. So I'm assuming that somehow that only likes to be on its own as the master device, which kind of makes sense. It's meant to be plugged directly into the SBC or something like this, just right there in the IDE channel doing its own thing solo. But anyway, totally works with a compact flash thing. So I'm gonna use that for now or just go without the CD-ROM for now until I find another solution. Alrighty, finally time to power it up and see what it can do with some games and benchmarks and whatnot. So let's go. And the power LED is no longer working. <laughs> it's always something. Hey, a note from future LGR here. I probably should have used a resistor when plugging in that power LED because I think it blew. Likely because I was giving it five volts directly. I probably should have used another source of power or a resistor. Anyway, that'll be a quick fix at some point in the future. But yeah, back to the video. But anyway, uh, at the moment I do at least have the CD-ROM and the hard disk replacement going. You can see them both right there detected, as well as our second serial port with the mouse plugged into PS2 here. And yeah, at the moment I just am still using a compact flash solution in there, not the disk on module. I'd like to use this, but yeah, it's just not cooperating with the CD-ROM. It takes precedence. It won't let anything else be on that channel. For now though, we have a working DOS 6.22 system with CD-ROM and all that. And with the drivers loaded, I have it set as the D drive. And we can just insert a disk with games and things on it or whatever. CDs and DOS, there's still something oddly special about it in my opinion, but yeah, works great. <laughs> Just again, doesn't like it when this is connected. So eh, I'll go ahead and run Zarg on here as a test. And it has detected all the things. However, it does play music, but only the music. For some reason, it doesn't play the sound effects, uh, and, I, and I don't know why. <laughs> I've set it up several different ways. I've tried different DMA channels with the jumpers and the sound card, different drivers, settings, and all that kind of stuff in the uh, startup files. It just doesn't seem to play sound effects on Zargon at all. <laughs> don't know. Perhaps it's a quirk of this particular sound card? I've actually never used it in another system, so I don't know. Maybe it's just busted. Jill of the Jungle is a similar situation where we get music, but no Sound Blaster sounds. I, I don't know. However, other games like Duke 3D, perfectly fine. So we got Sound Blaster sound effects, Sound Blaster music, or you know, ad lib compatible. <laughs> All right, so I've been fooling around with this thing just to try to figure out a little bit more about what might be going on with the sound card and been screwing around with 8-bit DMA because that is what Jill and Zargon would use as far as I know. And the way I had this configured on the board itself with the jumpers was having it set to DMA1, which is default. However, whenever I set it that way, there is a conflict of some kind. So I tried it on DMA0 tried it on DMA3, and I get the same results with both Jill of the Jungle and Zargon. And we can test it now. So it does work. I mean, all the channels work. Everything works. How pleasant. The thing is, it seems that Zargon and Jill only like it if it's on DMA1 
And yeah, I am using the fan patched version of Jill. I also tried older versions. I tried the shareware version. I tried a later registered version. None of them work on any of the DMA settings that I have here. Something on the SPC is conflicting with DMA1. I don't see anything in the BIOS though. But whatever, it plays Duke 3D and that's all I need. So here we go. And again, we are running with uh, just the built-in graphics, so there's no dedicated video card or anything. It does pretty good considering I don't really know the capabilities of whatever that Cirrus Logic thing is. But I can't imagine it's like <laughs> optimized for games. Uh, anyway, yeah, with the 486 that's in here, which is a 100 megahertz 486DX4. Yeah, it's not bad. I do get the expected slowdown when things get a little intense here and there. And this is just at 320 by 200. We're not doing <laughs> like 640 by 480 or anything like that because uh, it doesn't do terribly great with that. See real quick. So yeah, I mean, just lower frame rate all around at 640 by 480, which is really to be expected considering we're not running any particularly great graphics here. It could definitely benefit from a, a nice dedicated graphics card slotted in there somewhere. However, that DX4 and everything else does take it a little ways so we can run things like Quake halfway decently. <laughs> I, I did say halfway decently, uh, not, not terribly decently. Um, <laughs> Whatever, I'm not going up there. Oh, man. Definitely need some better dedicated graphics to do something like this, or even a Voodoo One. Uh, <laughs> That's if the PCI slots were supported. Uh, and unfortunately they are not. But even though we have them on the back plane, the SBC that we're using is an ISA only because it, I mean, it connects via the ISA bus. It's not gonna do anything with PCI, even though I think the chipset, the award BIOS and everything would technically support it, but it doesn't actually connect to the PCI slots that are on there. And that's what those are for on the back plane where we saw those ISA slots with PCI slots off to the right or just kind of behind them. It looks like it might be VLB, but it isn't. That's what that's for is connecting an SBC with ISA and PCI on the same card. I don't have a picture of one, but here is an illustration from a manual for one that I came across. And yeah, I'd love to find one of these just to take advantage of this back plane more properly. Even then though, I think we would be rather limited on the PCI cards that we could use because, you know, we don't have the full voltage and everything of an ATX power supply unless we were to connect one to it. So yeah, anyway, not gonna be plugging in any Voodoo cards into this, unfortunately, because we just can't use those PCI slots, which means that this SBC is not taking advantage of half of the stuff on the backplane. Really, I should have used one like this uh, this has eight ISA slots, so six 16-bit ones and two 8-bit right there. And so this would be you know, a little more suitable for this particular SBC because it at least would be able to use all the slots. And it only has AT power, doesn't even bother with ATX because honestly, you don't need it. Uh, but yeah, anyway, if I were to redo this, I would use this particular backplane. I don't know, maybe I, I will. I might just take it all apart and do it all over again because I'm a masochist. Let's give Descent a shot real quick because uh, eh, it's always a good one to test 
on a 486. You know, if I were thinking, I would have run Descent 2 because that has a built-in FPS thingy that you can use. I don't think the original Descent does, but anyway. Even without exact numbers, you can see that it runs quite well, all things considered. There we go. Hostage rescued. I just noticed the music sounds a little odd, doesn't it? So I'm messing around with the setup program for Descent here, and I had it on Sound Blaster 16 OPL3 mode, which is what this card is, and listen. I don't know about you, but that sounds very wrong to me. Sounds slow and the instruments are a little odd. If I switch it back over to just OPL2, Classic Sound Blaster FM. Yeah, that sounds as it should. So uh, <laughs> I don't think it's actually anything wrong with it necessarily. It's just, I'm definitely used to how it sounds with the OPL2 instead of the OPL3, like Sound Blaster 16 mode. So I'm gonna keep it on OPL2, <laughs> at least for Descent. And lastly, at least for now, I'm just gonna run some Commander Keen and Goodbye Galaxy. Episode four is always a great little thing to run because it is. Yeah, good old OPL2 sounds. Classic FM synth. Some of these slight sound irregularities that I'm running into on the other games though, really makes me want to put this particular sound card through some other additional paces, but that's yeah, outside of the scope of this video. Now let's go ahead and run some of these benchmarks from the Phil's Computer Lab DOS Benchmark Pack. And I'm gonna run 3D Bench just to see what this does, because, <laughs> yeah, you know, I just don't know. It's got those integrated graphics, but pretty decent CPU. So let's see what it does here. And the Woodgrain 46, I believe, was around like, okay, that's faster than the Woodgrain. I don't remember what it was with the, the Pentium Overdrive installed, but 62.5 is certainly quicker than that. Let's see if it runs any of these time demos. Let's put the Doom demo. Let that go through. Yeah, looking pretty good. No sound, of course. Not in this benchmark. All right, so that 3D benchmark that we ran just before this, it was 55.7 on the Woodgrain PC with the Pentium Overdrive going. So this is running quicker than that, which is no terribly big surprise. Uh, that wood grain computer has just got some other things slowing it down, I think, with the motherboard itself. But uh, the Doom demo, we got uh, 2245 real ticks. That one was 2134 game ticks and 2664 real ticks. An intriguing comparison. Of course, that one would not even run the Quake time demo. Let's see if it does here. Yeah, it's running it. Yeah, I, I don't know why this would not even boot up. It just wouldn't start at all on the Woodgrain PC. So uh, this is already a step above that and with a non-dedicated graphics card. I mean, I got a VLB thing going in the 486 and everything. This just has whatever's on board with that Cirrus Logic GD thing. All right, so we got 969 frames, 99.6 seconds, 9.7 FPS. That is a lot of nines. We can also check, check CPU to check our CPU and check. And uh, yeah, there it is, DX4 WB Enhanced, 100 megahertz internal, 33.5. Got that 3X multiplier going on. Genuine Intel. And also let cash check do its thing because uh, yeah, I'm sure that this is gonna be quicker than the wood grain thing. That, that, this is one of the deals about that motherboard or just, I don't know, the way it's set up or something, it's never been as fast as it needs to be. I'm thinking it might just be the memory too. It always seems to be rather slow 
All right, so looking at my 486's specs for this, uh, the L1 and L2 cache are about the same, but the main memory speed is like two and a half times as quick as the wood grain PC. So yeah, maybe I do need to swap out the main memory on that system and see what it does. And of course I gotta run some top bench here really quick. It's actually running a little bit faster. It's pretty comparable to what the wood grain PC is with the Pentium Overdrive installed. And this is a 100 megahertz 486. So I think that one was around 216 or something. This is pushing 220. And of course, I can't actually do anything with the turbo because like I said before, as I was putting things together, I don't have a turbo button header on the SBC that I'm aware of anyway. It's not in the documentation or anything. And there's no mention of anything like that in the BIOS either. So it's possible that I could maybe hook up the button to a clock multiplier jumper or something on there and rig that up, I don't know. But for now, I just don't have any turbo button option. It does nothing. Maybe there's a keyboard command for that. But again, without the exact documentation for this SBC, I don't know. Uh, none of the typical commands seem to have done anything that I've tried. So yeah, that's what that is. Well, I suppose that is about it for this build and this video anyway. There are a number of things that I would like to tweak and change and swap out and upgrade uh, pretty much the entire backplane <laughs> on retrospect. But hey, it's working quite well for what it is. And you know, like I said, I'm kind of impressed by the built-in graphics that are in there. I really wasn't sure what in the world kind of capabilities they would put in there considering it's all integrated onto one single card like that and isn't really meant for anything other than businessy industrial situations, but it's more than adequate. Maybe not ideal for every DOS game, but definitely good enough for a majority of things that I like to mess around with on DOS PC builds anyway. Uh, but yeah, I guess about the only thing that I'm also really considering is maybe doing like a wood grain wrap. I don't know. You know, I've done that before. So do I really need to do it again? Do you think that it looks fine? and the lovely beige that we have here. Or could it go for a nice walnut or an oak texture? <laughs> I kind of like it as it is. You know, it's just a classic beige box and uh, it looks pretty neat, I think, with the black faceplate drives and everything up front, which I did in order to try and match the buttons down below. So, eh, overall, I quite like it. But anyway, let me know your thoughts, what you would like to see done with this machine, or what you would do with it yourself, or if you've done any similar builds on your own, with SBCs or otherwise. This is something that I've never messed with before in terms of the whole SBC thing, so it's been a, a fun learning experience. But that's it for this episode of LGR, and as always, thank you very much for watching.